Um, and so Darcy has had some problem connecting. But her topic, which is nutrition um, for patients and uh, their families in relation to the effect of nutrition on melanoma, and we all know what to eat, but I think we'll hear about this from a couple of vantages uh, today. One, uh, the nutritional aspect that Darcy will talk about uh, initially. The second from Dr. Devar, who will talk about the microbiome, the bugs that are in our guts, which are um, vastly larger in number than uh, our own uh, cells in our bodies. If Darcy has connected, um, Eric, Darcy is connected, John. Not? Good morning. So sorry about that. Having some technical we'll difficulties. All right, so I had to send my slide deck to Eric. So he is going to share that for me because I wasn't able to open that from my iPad because my PC wasn't working. So again, I apologize everyone. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Darcy Plowcha. I'm one of the PAs with Dr. Kirkwood's team. I focus on the patients on our clinical trials, which there are many. So I help um, manage the patients on the trials, side effects, et cetera, um, with the help of the other PAs and the docs on our team. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about nutrition and melanoma. So nutrition is such a broad subject, and I only have 10 minutes. So I, what I did was I narrowed it down to electrolytes. So that's what we are going to focus on today. Um, I know last year when Melissa gave her nutrition talk, she focused a lot, a lot on the microbiome which is also um, super important, but I just wanted to kind of touch on the electrolytes. You know, we always talk to the patients about, oh, this is low, that's low, we're gonna replace this. And so I wanted to go over why that matters and also talk about some natural foods um, that can help because I do get that question a lot. All right, so starting off, we're gonna talk about, like you said, the electrolytes. So what exactly are electrolytes and what do they do for us? So just a broad definition, um, electrolytes are minerals that are found in your blood and your body tissues. Um, important thing about them is they have an electrical charge. And so that helps, as you can see on the slide, move nutrients into cells and move waste out of cells. So those electrical charges are important in the movement of um, nutrients in and out of the body. They also help balance our water and make sure that nerves, muscles, like the heart and also the brain are working properly. So without those, we would have, um, we would, when those are low, all those functions aren't working properly and it can be, um, it can, as we'll see here, cause a lot of side effects. Okay, go ahead, you can go to the next slide. So just a little bit about sodium and potassium. I put them together on this slide because they really do work together. And as you can see, they kind of have opposite effects. So the main role of potassium is going to be to help maintain fluid levels inside of our cells. Um, also is responsible for our muscles contracting and supporting normal blood pressure. And oppositely, the sodium is helpful or is responsible for maintaining normal fluid levels outside of the cells. So these work closely together and they both have effects on the blood pressure. So as you can see on the bottom there, high salt intake, as many people know, does increase blood pressure. But I think something a lot of people don't realize is that high potassium intake can relax the blood vessels and excrete sodium. So get rid of that sodium, which then can lower the blood pressure. So that can be important for patients that are having issues with blood pressure. Um, I am going to talk more about potassium coming up here as well as some of the other electrolytes. I, I left sodium for last and it's going to be brief because there are a lot of different issues involving sodium. So that's a whole nother lecture in itself. So we may get back to that if we have time. Go ahead to the next slide. So what is low potassium? You may hear the, med the technical medical term for that is hypokalemia, so low potassium. We do see that commonly with GI losses. So that would be vomiting and diarrhea, something we always think about if patients are not um, keeping food down. So symptoms of low potassium, and this is kind of the basis of my talk today is maybe symptoms and food to manage. So muscle weakness, uh, muscle cramping. I think a lot of patients are aware of that, but it can also cause fatigue, 
constipation, and those cramping can include respiratory and GI muscles. So that can make it more difficult to breathe or have, um, you know, in addition to constipation, having GI cramping. The thing that as a medical provider, I worry the most about with low potassium, it's going to be cardiac arrhythmia. So that means when your heart is not beating normally, um, as well as EKG abnormalities. So we can see something called um, some T wave changes and things like that. They can indicate that the heart's not working properly. So patients with super low potassium, you know, below two or yeah, below two, even below three sometimes, or below three, we will definitely be wanting to get an EKG to make sure you're not having any changes there. Um, the kidney, or sorry, low potassium also affects the kidneys. So it can decrease your phosphate reabsorption, which in the kidney, the kidneys are responsible for keeping that phosphate in the bloodstream. And so if you have a low potassium, that can lead to a low phosphorus. Um, we will talk about phosphorus a little bit more coming up here because I do see that pretty commonly with our immunotherapies. And then another, I think, lesser known um, side effect of low potassium would be reducing insulin secretion. So your body's releasing less insulin, which leads to higher glucose levels. So that's something else we may be um, looking at for you guys. Go to the next slide. So here's my little chart I found um, on ePain Assist. So it has potassium rich foods. Everybody I think knows about bananas, but as you can see, there are plenty of other foods that are high in potassium that we can supplement our diets with. Sweet potatoes is a really good one. Um, and just um, fruits and ven veggies like broccoli, um, bananas, we can see it with salmon and even coconut water. I know some of our patients are um, like to drink that, so that can help as well. Go to the next slide. So next we'll talk about the phosphorus, like I said. So phosphorus is the second most abundant mineral in the body after calcium. 85% is stored in the bones and the teeth. So phosphorus's responsibility in your body is to filter out waste in the kidneys and also plays a role in how your body stores and uses energy. Um, little known fact, it can also help reduce muscle pain after a workout. Go ahead to the next slide. So low phosphorus is a nice long word, hypophosphatemia. So that can be caused or worsened by um, diabetes, patients with alcoholism because they're not absorbing things well. Um, again, starvation, if you're, if you're not eating much, you're not going to have a high potassium level. And then other diseases that cause absorption abnormalities, such as Crohn's disease, which makes your body not absorb these things properly. And then as we just discussed, low potassium can also cause low phosphorus because it's not being reabsorbed in the kidneys. Um, there are also some medications that can cause that. So we have to think about diuretics or water pills, which are often known for causing low potassium, but can also affect phosphorus as well. And sometimes antacids, because again, the absorption isn't there. So symptoms of low phosphorus. Um, I will say I don't see this very often um, because usually our patients don't have um, extremely low phosphorus, it's usually pretty mild, but we can see anxiety or irritability, bone pain, stiff joints, fatigue, numbness, or weakness. And like I said below, um, often the cases that I see are asymptomatic. The patients have no idea and no complaints when I see them and then their phosphorus comes back low. Um, so we usually will replace that with oral supplements, sometimes IV, but not very often. And then go ahead to the next slide. So here's some food sources for phosphorus. So something to keep in mind, phosphorus is going to be present in protein rich foods, nuts, cheese, fish, and beef. Um, I had one patient who was unable to tolerate the phosphorus pills. And so we figured out that um, if he drank almond milk every day, his phosphorus was in the normal range. So that's what worked for him. So sometimes we have to work together to figure out what's the best option for you. Cause obviously some people do have dietary restrictions. All right, go ahead to the next slide. Um, next is magnesium. So magnesium has a lot of functions in the body as well. It's helpful to, for building proteins and strong bones, regulating blood sugar and blood pressure, just like our sodium and potassium. 
It supports muscles and nerve functions. It's an electrical conductor for your muscles. And again, similar to the phosphorus, a lot of it is stored in your bones. Go to the next slide. All right, so low magnesium, also called hypomagnesemia, um, causes include low intake, malabsorption, similar to the phosphorus we just talked about, um, and alcohol abuse. Um, diuretics and proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec or omeprazole or pentoprazole or protonics, um, any of those similar to the phosphorus can cause low magnesium. So symptoms of mag low magnesium are fatigue, weakness, decreased appetite, nausea, vomiting, numbness, tingling, muscle cramps, seizures, and abnormal heart rate. So a whole, you can see a lot of overlapping um, side effects from these things. So this is why when patients are experiencing these types of issues, we really want to check all the electrolytes. You can't rule out just one. All right, next slide. And foods for magnesium. I really like this um, picture I found online from your supplements. It talks a little bit more, not just the um, foods that are high in magnesium, but also kind of gives you a little background about how much is in each thing. So like, for example, dark chocolate. So that's going to be the higher percent cocoa, the more magnesium. So you can have 15% of your daily magnesium in a one ounce square, which is kind of nice, nice little treat. Um, again, bananas are, are great. Chia seeds are a good one. And those also are high in omega-3s and iron, um, yogurts, brown rice, Spinach is good for, for that as well. All right, go ahead to the next slide. All right, and so I am, since I was late starting, I apologize again, I am not going to talk too much about low sodium hyponatremia. So there are many, many different mechanisms that can cause low sodium in the body. It's a, a very tight balance with the water, but just to be aware of symptoms, nausea, vomiting, headaches, confusion, or altered mental status, lethargy. And if it's low, really low, we worry about seizures and coma. So low sodium is a very big deal, something we take seriously. And then obviously the management of treating the low sodium depends on what's causing it. So that's a whole nother lecture we can talk about at another time. Um, going to the next slide. So that's all I have for you today. I just wanted to thank um, my student, Angela Wu, for helping me with this presentation. Does anyone have any questions?